Hi, everyone. Um, good evening. My name is Azim. Uh, so thanks for coming to the Project Intern Talk. Um, so we run this talk every year around this period uh, to help people understand the importance of internships and how to basically navigate the process of securing an internship. So um, a quick background. Uh, my name is Azim, as I mentioned. I previously worked at GovTech, Shopee, and Stripe, and I'll be starting at Stripe in August uh, later this year. Uh, with me today is Kokmuri. Kokmuri, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, I'm Kok Murray. So previously I worked at um, this US um, security company called Trail of Bits and ByteDance, and now I'm in Databricks in America. All right, so thank you. Um, so the two of us will be your presenters uh, for today. And a quick uh, overview of how we're going to structure today's uh, talk. So from now until about 8.20, we're going to talk about internships, um, what they are, why we should do them, how we can navigate uh, the process of getting an internship. Then we're going to move on to a quick 10 minute break and then we'll have a panel discussion. We've got six people from the industry who are recent grads or people who have graduated some time back. We're going to talk about this process of securing and navigating internships. Um, and then uh, you also have a chance to submit questions. So you can see the ask a question thing at the top. You can just go to that link and submit your questions. Um, we've also taken questions earlier from folks who have RSVP. Um, so we'll have a mix of those questions. And then from 9 to 9.30, we'll have a breakout room with all the panelists and you guys can go in and ask them questions and interact with them yourself, right? Okay, cool. So let's uh, get started. So today's philosophy is that we're going to talk about the high level idea of how to navigate and uh, the internship process and to prepare for internships. But we're not going to go into the nitty gritty. So we're not going to talk about how to write a good resume or how to write a cover letter or like how should you arrange things, that sort of stuff, right? We've got a lot of links in this presentation. And um, the links to the slides were already given out earlier. We'll dump them in the chat as well. Um, and we're going to upload this recording to YouTube. So come back and revisit this. Go through the links one by one yourself so that you have the idea of um, the resources that, we're, that we are referring to. Um, and if you have specific questions later on during the panel discussion uh, or the breakout rooms, you guys can ask that. Um, but the, the point of this talk is to not uh, tell you uh, all these minuscule nitty gritty details, right? So as I mentioned, um, you can post your questions above uh, on the Google Slides Q&A, and, &A, and uh, we'll be then using those questions for the panel discussion later as well. Uh, right, so let's talk about why we should do an internship. And so um, the idea behind why we should do an internship uh, is broken down into two parts. Um, first is the more sort of uh, technical and academic side of things. Um, and then the second part of it in blue is the, the more soft skills part of it, right? Or the more social side of things. So um, it's a graduation requirement for, uh, well, all CS majors and also a bunch of other like tech related majors. So like your uh, DSA and uh, information systems and BizA and so on, right? Um, it gives you real world experience. Um, so it lets you turn theory into practice and helps you understand the kind of work or, that you're interested in doing after you graduate. Um, on the more softer side of things, you get to meet new people, you get to explore the world if you go overseas. And of course, there's money and a lot of other perks uh, that come from doing an internship. So let's go through these things uh, one by one. All right. So graduation requirement is uh, a very straightforward one. For those of you, I think, who matriculated before 22-23, so before this past academic year, um, I think you need to do 12 MCs of industrial uh, experience requirement. That is for CS majors. For the other tech adjacent majors, I think you have something similar. Um, so that means either you do one um, advanced technology attachment program, so one semester-long internship, uh, sorry, six-month-long internship, or you do two summer internships. Um, I think that's been revised recently, so now it's only one um, summer internship is required. Uh, but it is also important to note that internships are very helpful in helping you convert your theory into practice, right? So um, if you have an understanding of uh, what you like to do, and you have an understanding of the theory stuff that you learn in school, you can put it into practice and you can see the direct link between um, the stuff you learn in school and how it's applied in the real world outside. And this is not just constrained to things like software engineering internships, because um, you might do like a machine learning or AI internship, you might do something closer to research, and this will all help you understand um, the kind of stuff that you like to do. So beyond just the scale of work or the kind of work that you're looking at, um, it's also other things that are important in the kind of workplace that you end up going to. So it could be things like company skill. Uh, are you interested in working at a startup, which is going to be a lot more close-knit? You might be wearing many, many hats versus big tech where things are a little bit more siloed and you might be working on one focused thing. 
uh, you might also care about things like how easily accessible your, your managers are, for example, in big tech companies, that might be harder because there's a more structured hierarchy versus in the startup, you might be talking straight to the CEO on a daily basis. Um, you might also be concerned with the kind of work that you're doing. So is are you building a product? Are you working for a quant firm where you're building like trading algorithms? Are you working for a consultancy, which is constantly getting new clients and new projects? So what do you care about? Uh, lastly, you would also probably want to figure out whether uh, the kind of role you're looking for matches your experience as well as your interests. So do you want to do front-end engineering or back-end engineering? Do you want to work on a product? Do you want to do product management, which is a bit more tech adjacent? Do you want to do something that's data engineering or infrastructure related? This sort of thing is very important because if you go to your first job and then you realize that, oh, I don't like what I'm doing, you're going to have to take some time to maybe like deal with it before you can move to a different role. But on the other hand, internship gives you the time and space to explore and figure out uh, the kind of work that you want to be doing. Right. So um, let's talk about the process of applying for an internship. So basically, this can be broken down into four steps, right? Um, the first step, of course, being that you should know what you don't know. So you should know the process. Uh, then you should prepare to apply. So there's two parts of the preparation. The first part is the resume stage, where you need to basically get your resume ready and send it out to all the different places. And the second one is, of course, the interview. So preparing for interviews and the different rounds that the interview consists of. Uh, next would be then to actually go through the application process. So you need to know where to find internships, uh, possibly look for referrals if you can obtain them. And um, of course, the mental process that, or the mental model behind dealing with uh, rejections. And lastly, uh, going through the interview process itself, right? So um, assuming for most tech companies, it's going to look something like this. You would apply and then you would go through an online assessment. So this is going to be on a platform like HackerRank or Codility or something like that. They'll give you a question. It'll give you a couple of like maybe one to two hours to solve some number of questions. Um, after you go through that, they'll probably um, set up like an interview with you. So you might have anywhere between two to six rounds of interviews with a real person on the other end asking you some coding questions or some system design questions, something like that. And then um, assuming you clear all of that, you get an offer or anywhere in between something doesn't work out and then you get a rejection. Right, so now in the grand scheme of things, where does this timeline fit in, right? So uh, it's May 2023, today you're here watching this talk and you know figuring these things out. Over the course of summer 2023, that means May, June, July, um, that's when you build your experience and you prepare your resume, uh, as well as preparing for interviews. Uh, preparing for interviews and getting a resume up and running is something that takes time and it's something that you cannot do last minute. So um, because of the way that a lot of these, these internship companies work, where their pipelines get filled up very quickly, if you start doing all this work as the job openings show up, you're going to likely miss a couple of these um, jobs because they get flooded by applicants and then your thing gets put in somewhere at the back, right? So preparing these things over the course of summer 2023 is very important. And it'll also give you the confidence to get ready and go out and interview without saying that, oh, I'm worried that I'm not good enough or I haven't. Uh, prepare myself for the interview process. Then come August 2023, um, you start applying and companies have postings that start as early as August and as late as November. So you need to keep an eye out, apply and go through the interview process. So let's talk about um, preparing your resume. Uh, for those people here who are freshmen, um, you might be wondering, um, how do I prepare my resume? And, and, and if you're new to like the tech scene, that's probably something you're thinking about as well. So there are some really, really good resources. The Tech Interview Handbook, which is run by uh, Yang Chun, uh, has a section on preparing your resume. And Ken Kenneth, who is also in the Project Intern Chat, uh, his website talks about how his resume has evolved over time. So you can use that as a point of reference on how you can build the resume and what goes into your resume. There are also some really, really good templates out there for resume. Um, and maybe you can look into doing your resume in LaTeX as well um, because it's just easier to update uh, because you basically have a code first uh, template and you can just update your things quickly, right? So you can come back and revisit these things later. Um, but some of the key guidelines for your resume are as follows. The first thing is you want to keep things to one page. The main reason for this is because uh, recruiters and companies are flooded by uh, applicants. And so you want to condense your information, keep it in one page, keep it concise right? If you are new, so that means you're a freshman, you don't have a lot of experience, put in everything you can think of. Anything that explains your background, projects you've worked on, uh, whether you've done something for a class as like, you know, like a small little bot to help your, your prof or as a TA or whatever, put in everything you can think of that is relevant. 
right? Even if you think it's very lame or it doesn't matter, put it in because everyone starts somewhere, right? When you have more experiences, then you can curate and put things which are more relevant to the role you're looking for. But if you have nothing to put in, then put in everything that you think is relevant first. Um, in each section in your resume, showcase your strengths. It's really important that you talk about your contributions to that project. Did you lead the project? Were you the back-end lead or the front-end lead? Did you conceptualize the whole thing? Were you the one negotiating with um, a client or something? Or are, are you the person talking to the stakeholders of the project? Put all of these things in. And make sure that whatever you put into your resume, you have the ability to talk about it. So the reason this is important is because when people start asking you or when interviewers ask you, uh, oh, what did you do here? You should be able to turn that into a conversation about like the challenges you face, um, why this thing was important and why you cared about the work that you're doing. And that conversation allows you to showcase your talent, ability and passion. So make sure that you are intimately um, acquainted with the projects that you put on your resume. Don't put something in and then forget about it for a year. Before you apply or before you go in for an interview, look through your resume one more time to make sure that you can talk about the things that are on your resume. Right. So uh, um, as I mentioned, a common question that does show up is, what if I have nothing to put? Right. So um, personal projects are a great thing to put onto your, your resume. And now that it's summer, if you're a freshman, this is a great time to go and build something on your own. Right. So what can you build? Um, Building solutions to problems you or other people face is a really, really good starting point, right? Um, alternatively, you can look into this build your own X thing where you can build your own uh, version of Git or build your own version of like an interpreter for a language or build your own game or whatever. Uh, do these things for yourself so that you learn. And then you can put this on your, on your resume and say, this is a personal project I worked on to learn whatever. Uh, you can also contribute to open source if you feel that this, this project that you're very interested in and passionate about because you think it's doing good work and you want to help that project. And YouTube tutorials are something that you can also write if you have learned something and you want to share that knowledge. So let me give you some examples of um, what I mean by a solution to the problem you face. So this was something that a friend of mine built, I think two years back. I don't know if this website is still up anymore, but basically if you put DLN in front of youtube.com and you have the video ID or download that video, so my friend was learning how to work with Rust. Um, and so he basically built this very simple video scraper thing so that um, he can download YouTube videos himself, right? So this is a very simple personal project that you can work on. Another one built by another friend of mine was a bot to basically check your icon credits. So if you stay in, in an NUS on-campus accommodation you'll real, and you have an icon room, uh, you'll know that you need to log into this portal and then check your icon credits. So he built a simple Telegram bot that would you can key in your... Um, that the username and password they provide to you and it will check your icon credits for you instead of you having to log into that, that portal. Um, another friend of mine built an interpreter in Golang and he did this um, just so that he could learn how to build an interpreter. So he, he wanted to get familiar with um, Go, the language, and he wanted to, to learn how to build an interpreter. So he followed a book and he built his own interpreter and that's on his resume as well. Uh, if you don't know how to build something, so that means it's not a problem of you not having ideas, but it's a problem of skill. Then there's a lot of information out there. Um, a great starting point would be, if you're interested in web development, would be the Mozilla Development Networks uh, documentation, as well as the Odin project. So the Odin project basically build, guides you through building a simple web application in uh, Ruby, or Rails, Ruby on Rails or JavaScript, and gives you all the information you need to learn basic front-end and back-end programming. So that's a great starting point. If you already know how to do that and you want to pick up something else, we run this thing called Hacker School. So it runs once a week during the semester where we teach like different skills, like how to build a Telegram bot or how to um, automate things in Python or introduction to various other technologies like Docker or whatever. Um, come and join these workshops where we teach you the basics and how to get started in these technologies and then you can take it further yourself. Right? Okay. So um, other areas that you can consider cultivating an interest. So maybe this sort of software engineering like stuff is not for you. If you're interested in machine learning, you can check out Kaggle. Um, if competitive programming is your thing, Code Forces is a great place to go and practice. And if security is your thing, CTF competitions are held at ctftime.org. So the philosophy behind going and doing things on your own is not only applicable to this SWE kind of rules, right? Um, in every one of these fields, you can do your own personal projects, you can build problems you want to solve, uh, or solve problems that you are facing yourself. And that is very important because it gives you a start in figuring out what's the kind of work you want to do and something you can talk about in interviews, right? Okay, so that was a little fast, um, I, yeah. But anyway, so 
Um, the last aspect of preparing um, for application is a cover letter, right? So uh, a common question that comes up is, do you need a cover letter? And unless the application forces it, it is not really necessary. So a good cover letter is something that takes effort to write. And if you're applying to a lot of places, it will be very draining to write a cover letter per job application. So if it's a lot, if it's not required, don't, don't necessarily spend time doing it unless you're really, really passionate about that specific job, right? Um, so over here, we've got um, my personal opinion of what an effective cover letter could look like. Uh, and you guys can go and take a look at this link later on. But unless necessary, I think it's not really um, something that's very important to do. So now we move on to the next stage of preparing for interviews, which is the actual interview prep itself. So now I'll be talking a bit about um, how to prepare for these interviews that hopefully you'll be getting, right? Once you've created your resume and sent it into companies, um, what to expect from the in interview process. Um, so first thing, we'll start off with these like online guides on how to prepare. I think these are like quite common, right? Like people usually send these links around um, in the project intern chat and when discussing interview prep. The first one is um, this tech in interviewhandbook.com, uh, .org which is a really good like introduction to interview prep, right? Not only does it tell you like how you should start to prepare, it kind of tells you like what to expect and what your interviewers are looking out for, right? So it's not just about going to the interview and like solving the problem. There are other things like communication and soft skills that they might be looking out for. And then the Asana technical interview guide is um, a bit more detailed, right? So it goes, it's significantly longer than the techinterviewhandbook.org and it kind of shows you what, um, Asana specifically looks out for, but we find that it's generally transferable to other companies. And sometimes when you're applying for internships and going through interviews, um, each, like your individual companies might also have prepared like technical interview guides that will share more about like what the interview process is at this specific company. Um, usually it's useful to reach out to your recruiter to ask if that exists for them. So for example, a certain company may not expect you to talk while you code, um, whereas a certain company might expect you to talk while you code a lot more than normal, right? So it's useful to kind of get this information out from your recruiters. Um, but the general philosophy behind interview prep is that you just need to practice, right? So interviews, like these technical interviews um, are generally all about solving algorithmic problems, right? And the way most people practice is just do lead code questions consistently, right? You can just do like two to three every weekend. And the reason behind this is to get yourself into the mental space of interviewing and solving these algorithmic problems, right? Um, even if you've gone through a data structures and algorithm course, um, you might not, not be very familiar with solving these problems if it's been a few months or you might not be familiar with like writing out code and talking about code. And speaking of that, it's also important to do mock interviews with friends, right? It's one thing to um, see a problem live and then solve it, um, which is what you do in like an OA or online assessment or what you do with lead code, right? But it's also important to kind of develop the skill of like talking through your algorithmic solutions uh, and mock interviews with friends um, help with this. Right, and the last thing is um, try not to avoid difficult questions. I think this is quite common, especially if you're first starting out, right? So like you see a problem that you can't solve, then you're, you get a bit demoralized, then you just move on to like questions you're uh, more familiar with, right? But if you just keep skipping questions and like don't even bother um, attending them or thinking about them, um, you won't really like learn to solve these problems. And um, what we suggest is if you get stuck, um, just look at it quickly, uh, look at a solution quickly and then move on, right? So um, it's not worth, ignoring the question entirely. It's also not worth spending like three or four days thinking about how to solve it and um, like delaying the rest of the things with like your life and, and preparation, right? So just look at a solution, try to make sure you understand it completely and then move on. Um, so it's important for us to note that this entire process is exhausting, right? It's exhausting for everyone, but it's also important if you want to get into this field if you want to get the software engineering internship. And something that I think it's useful for us to tell you is that it gets a lot easier as you do more, right? So within like the same internship application cycle, as you do more internships, uh, as you do more interviews, um, subsequent interviews will get easier because actually doing technical interviews are a great way to prepare for future technical interviews, right? And as you do more internship application cycles, um, these interviews will also get easier as you get more comfortable with what to expect and, and how you perform. Um, so the other aspects of interviews that you may face during the interview process when applying for an internship, right? So I think resume deep dives are pretty common and usually these happen along with your technical interviews. So maybe an interview is like um, one hour, then like the first 15 minutes, they'll go through your resume, then the last 45 minutes, they um, throw you an algorithm problem, right? So um, with resume deep dives, 
I think one of the most important things to do is reread your resume. I think Azim previously mentioned that it's possible that interviewers ask you anything about your resume, right? So maybe you've included things which are useful, but you've done like two or three years ago and you might have forgotten already. So when an interviewer asks you about that, uh, you might like take some time to recall, right? So it's important for you to like reread and be familiar with the things on your resume before you enter an interview. And um, in terms of like technical experience, try to recall things you did and engineering decisions you made, right? It's possible that maybe you're year four now, then you have like a year one internship in your resume. Then they ask you like, oh, why do you use like Python instead of like C++? And then you need to like justify this. And if you're not familiar with what you did and familiar with the decisions you made, um, you might get like, it might get awkward like, in the interview. So it's important to be familiar with that. And also one other thing is to prepare concise summaries of your work. Oftentimes, like sometimes in interviews, like these introductory, like resume dives, um, maybe an interviewer just sees them as a formality, right? And then if you did something that um, maybe a bit more complicated, it's not really useful for you to be like tripped up over explaining what you did for like five or 10 minutes, right? So try to prepare concise summaries of um, what you did uh, in your past internships or in your projects. Um, then the other type of like non-technical interview round that you will face um, quite commonly is the behavioral round. So these are things like, oh, tell me about a time where you managed a conflict or disagreed with your boss or um, why do you want to work for this company, right? So um, like a really good and like universally accepted way to approach these kind of questions is this star format. So situation, task, action, and result. Um, here we have two links, which the first one is like this PDF, which explains how to approach a bunch of common interview questions. The second one is again by techinterviewhandbook.org. Um, which goes through, which gives you a list of like common interview questions specifically in um, tech interviews. And I think both are really useful. And what um, you can do to prepare is, again, recall your previous involvement. So this is not just technical experience, but um, things you did, maybe it could be your JCCCA or even like NS, right? All these things uh, kind of should demonstrate like your ability to work in a team, ability to resolve conflicts, ability to... Um, be a good employee at the company, basically, uh, and try to prepare anecdotes for different situations, right? So what I personally did was I grouped um, certain si situations um, and like attached them to specific uh, uh, past experiences, right? So if I'm going to talk about like conflict with my superiors or something, uh, I, I just have a mental note that, okay, I'll probably bring up NS. If I'm going to talk about working in a team to like meet the tight deadline, I'll talk about um, uh, my JCCCA. Um, so this makes things a lot easier during the interview um, when you don't have to like, um, when, when you're presented with a question that you may not be familiar with, but you are trying to like dig back through all your past experiences to find out which is most appropriate. So it's useful to prepare. Uh, and that's a lot of stuff, right? So Azim and I have covered like resumes and cover letters and interviews, and there's a lot to digest and we understand that. Um, but the like the important thing is to just take this one step at a time, right? Um, this isn't going to be easy, um, but as long as you just do it one step at a, at a time, right? You create your resume, you start um, doing lead code questions, um, you will get through this process, right? It can be overwhelming, but you have time, right? Um, going back to this, um, going back to this slide, remember that like now is like May 2023 uh, and internship applications will usually start around August and you'll be interviewing from August to December, right? So from now until August, we have the whole summer uh, where you can do what you want, right? Like many of you, especially freshmen are in Orbital or doing CVWO, um, that's useful, right? Many of you can take this time to build whatever personal project you want. That's also useful, right? It demonstrates that you can code, it demonstrates you can probably work in a team. And even if it's something that's not necessarily technical and something you don't associate with like, oh, good preparation for your, a good resume for the, or good preparation for a technical interview. If you're doing things like volunteering or like organizing an orientation. Um, these are things that get you experience and anecdotes that will still be useful in showing who you are as a person and a teammate, right? So it's important to spend this time doing things you enjoy and uh, reminding yourself that you know, these things are still helpful. Um, so now we go on to applying for internships, right? So let's say the summer is over, you spend the time doing things you like and doing things that hopefully are helpful to you. Once we get to August, um, how do we actually apply for internships, right? Um, the good thing for us is that tech internships are usually very, very easy to apply for, right? It takes like 15 seconds. Usually you just fill up your bio data, you put your name, your email, so on and so forth, and then you upload your resume and you click submit. That's it, right? Um, some a, a note that we will add here, is that um, you should try to apply for internships on company websites. Right? So maybe you see an internship posting on um, different um, different sources, right? We'll go through them later, but maybe you see um, an internship posting on LinkedIn or like on Talent Connect, 
Um, and maybe on LinkedIn, you'll see like this easy apply button, which may look very tempting, right? Um, in almost all cases, it's more useful to just go directly to the company's website and apply for the internship on the company's website itself, right? It's usually easier for like the recruiting team to see because um, usually like, um, like there are occasions where if you apply on LinkedIn or you apply on Talent Connect or apply on whatever um, job aggregator, um, your application doesn't go directly to um, the recruiting pipeline of that company. So apply on the company's website. Um, then now your question could be, um, where do you actually find these internships? Right. So one good way to do this, uh, which is something Azim and I both do, is just to set up a LinkedIn job alert. Right. So on LinkedIn, you can just type in software engineer intern, then you can select the location you want. So I personally do Singapore and the United States. Um, then you can save it as a job alert. Then what will happen is that every day you either get an email or you get like a notification on LinkedIn, like if you have the mobile app saying like, oh, here are like 10 jobs that maybe match your search and match your profile. Right. That's really useful, right? It gives you a consistent stream of internships. Sometimes you'll get postings that aren't internships or you might not be interested in. That's fine. But it takes like 20 seconds to just like go through that list that LinkedIn sends you and then see um, if there's any applications or any postings that you want to apply for, right? The other job aggregators that might be useful for you. So Untapped uh, is another job aggregator that's slowly gaining traction. Simplify, I think mainly is a tool for you to autofill applications, but they also have like really great lists of job postings. And it was really useful for me when applying for US internships. There's this cscareers.dev site, which isn't a job aggregator, but what it does have is this like process tracking sheet. Right? So like internship applicants from around the world, they use this site and then they'll help people update. Right? So if like I get to the interview round of like Amazon, I'll just like indicate uh, on this website, process tracking, street, uh, process tracking sheet that, oh, I'm at the interview stage of Amazon. And that's mostly to help people like kind of see where each company is in the pipeline. Or you can also use that sheet to like figure out what companies are actively hiring and what companies are progressing people through the uh, internship process pipeline, right? So that's useful. And the last thing, which is more recent, is Ripple Match. So I think what Ripple Match tries to do is like match you to specific companies. Um, but I think it's more similar to Untapped, right? So you can still use it as a job aggregator. Um, other places to find internships are career fairs and events. So SOC organizes a career fair mid-August. For incoming freshmen, this is like quite soon. Right, like the second you step into SOC, then there's a career fair already. That's fine. Um, there's also a second career fair in semester two, but this mid-August career fair is probably most useful for you to apply for next summer's internships. Um, SOC and CFG also has a lot of these ad hoc events like recruitment talks, which you can go for, and hackathons and similar events um, usually have sponsor booths with company reps ready to talk about um, opportunities they have at their companies. Right, so you can go to these events and talk to the sponsors. Um, so something you'll notice so far is that um. Finding internship postings boils down to going to where place going to places where companies um, put themselves, right? So companies want to hire people, they put their postings on job aggregators. Um, companies want to like have a presence at events, they put themselves and, and physically, I guess, in a lot of these events, right? So you can take advantage of this if you're targeting specific groups of companies and be a bit more creative, right? So for example, if you're looking for a startup, right, you can just find a venture capital firm and look at their portfolio companies. And now you have a nicely curated list of um uh, startups which have like non-zero amount of funding they can apply for and a lot of these like VC firms have their own events and programs right so Greylock Tech Fair is this career fair by Greylock which is a VC firm that's actually upcoming I think applications are, applications are open there are these like eight VC fellowships and Kleiner Perkins fellowships that um, what they serve to do is like you apply to a central fellowship and then the VC companies will like place you into individual companies for internships or full-time jobs you can also just go look for an incubator like Block 71 or look for something like SG Summation, or SG Innovate Summation, right? Then look for the companies that they support and then apply to these companies. If you're interested in like research adjacent work, a lot of CS, like all CS research conferences have sponsors, right? So if I'm interested in like databases, I'll just go to like the very large database conference and then look at what companies sponsor them. And there's a good likelihood that these companies are interested in doing like cutting edge database work, right? So this is... Um, this is another approach you can use to find internships. And also the last thing is your life, right? So you can just go unlock your phone and look at every app you have or like look at every like promotional email you receive and every service you use and then just Google app name internship, right? So like, for example, I use Spotify, I Google Spotify internship. And this is a good way to um, find out companies, like, like look for internships and also like find companies um, with products that you actually like.
Um, so this is what it kind of looks like, right? When looking for an internship. So let's say I use Robinhood. I just type into Google Robinhood internship. I probably get a link to Robinhood, Robinhood's career page. And then I just go join the team, right? So I see here early talent, Android engineer. Here is like a greenhouse on the right, which is like one of the application, um, one of the types of application portals you'll see. Um, so this is a greenhouse application. If you look at that, it's very simple, right? It's just um, your bio data, um, and then your LinkedIn profile, and you'll probably have to up, uh, upload your resume, and that's it, right? Um, a special note for um, graduating students, um, usually in the US, um, there's a distinction between like the software engineer job posting and a new grad or early career or university graduate posting, right? So usually software engineer is for people with some experience. Um, if you're looking for a full-time job as a fresh graduate, you'll have to look for early career or new grad postings. But this is like generally how it, work, how it works, right? Just go to the company's career page and apply. Um, so where can you find experience, right? Um, SOC can help with that, right? So um, the first link has a bunch of like open source projects that are maintained by School of Computing professors and students. And that's a really good place to start, right? With open source and with contributing like real code that is used by people. Um, there's also CVWO and Orbital where you can build things and work in teams and NUS enterprise startups. And many of them like hire NUS students, right? And, and these are all useful things um, that let you build projects and, and develop technical experience and also develop, interp inter develop interpersonal skills and like gain these anecdotes you can use um, for your behavioral interviews. Um, so the last thing is that um, the, um, we're going to talk about referrals, right? So sometimes people get very caught up about referrals, right? Um, it's important to note that referrals help, but they're not a must. Like they're neither a necessary nor sufficient condition right, to get an internship offer. Um, if you want to get a referral, don't be shy to ask seniors because as and most they say no. But remember that usually a referral, what it does is just get you through the resume screen, right? So at least you get an OER interview. It's not like a panacea, it's not gonna help you get an internship offer entirely. And not having an interview isn't going to going to doom you, right? Usually what it does is help you stand out among like all the like thousands of resumes that a company gets um, so that there's a higher likelihood um, you get past the resume screen and get an OER interview. But that's about it. Um, now we're going to talk a bit about rejections, right? So it's important to note that rejection is incredibly common, right? Like 90% of companies you apply to will probably reject you or more likely actually just ghost you, right? And the, the key point here is that um, applying for internships is a numbers game, right? Um, so like what this means for us, and we'll elaborate on this later, is that um, you should apply for internship application posting, for, like internship postings ASAP, right? Don't do this in batches. Don't be like, oh, I'll apply for three now and then wait for if any come back to me. And if not, I'll apply for three in two weeks time, right? Um, just apply for all the postings you're interested in. Um, if you need to like delay eventually, do it when you're scheduling interviews, right? But there's no point in like delaying and waiting for them to get back to you before applying for more internships. Um, something similar to this is that um, I think it's important not to be like too enamored with any individual company, right? If you go into an internship application cycle saying like, oh, I want only, I want to work at this specific one company, there's a very high likelihood you get rejected, right? You'll probably feel very disappointed and dejected and demoralized, right? So remember that this is a numbers game and remember that everyone else also struggles a lot, right? Everyone goes through this process and you only need one offer, right? It's okay if you apply to 100 places and 99 reject you because for summer, you only need one internship offer, right? Um, that's all you need. So um, don't take these rejections to heart. Just keep on applying until you get the offer you want. Um, something else important for like either your mindset when applying for internships is that uh, remember that um, like getting an offer is a combination of like skill and luck, right? So it's important to develop like skill and be prepared for interviews, like do lead code, have a good resume, so on and so forth. But remember that luck plays a huge component in getting an offer as well. And luck goes both ways, right? So um, if you don't get an offer, don't get too demoralized and feel like, oh, no one likes you, you're not a good engineer. But also try not to get let your highs get too high, right? So it's possible that um, you got previous offers or you got your current offer through a lot of luck, right? Um, if you get an offer, like, what this means is that you shouldn't feel like entitled, like, oh, I'm a great engineer. I'm going to do amazing. Next cycle, I need to get a company that's better than what I previously got, so on and so forth, right? Remember that luck plays a huge component um, and luck goes both ways. And that a rejection is not reflective of your worth as an engineer, 
right? All a rejection means is that for that specific interview process and that specific company, um, things didn't go right, right? Maybe they were looking for something else. Maybe you messed up a bit. Maybe you weren't feeling well that day. Um, it doesn't mean that you're a bad engineer if you get rejected, right? So don't take these rejections to heart. Something else that I think is useful to remember is that um, it's a bar, not a race, right? Um, so usually, like in general, companies just have this hiring bar that um, applicants have to meet in order to get an internship, right? It's not that they rank like all thousand or like ten thousand applications together, then they like rank them all individually and select the top five. That's not how it works for companies. They don't have the resources to do that, right? So you don't have to do better than everyone else. I think oftentimes, like you may look around and like see your peers and see like oh, they're all like smarter than me or like more accomplished than me. And then you feel very demoralized and oh, I don't deserve any internship and I'm probably not going to get an offer. Um, that's not the case, right? You don't have to do better than everyone else. You just have to meet each individual companies or like the company's hiring bar. And if you meet it, you get an offer. That's it. Okay, so um, what is the mental model when going through this application process, right? So we've talked a lot about um, what the process entails. We've talked a lot about what you can expect, but how you should how should you approach this um, this internship application process, right? And like the main way we think of it is to just work backwards from your goal, right? So let's say your goal is to get an internship offer. How do you do that, right? That you just keep working backwards, so on and so forth, right? And I think a useful thing, um, a useful way to think about this is um through this um relentlessly resourceful um trait um or mindset that um. Adve Powell writes about. So Adve is this um, NUS alumni who graduated like five years ago, but um, he wrote this blog post, which I think is really useful. And he also talks about um, a personal experience where as a freshman, he didn't get like callbacks from internships. So what he did when he wanted to work for a startup is he physically went down to Block 71 and just loitered out there and waited for um, employees of these companies and founders of these companies to stream out, right? And eventually he got to talk to a company, got an interview and interned there, right? You don't have to do the exact, the exact same thing, right? Maybe this is a bit of an extreme example, but the point is to be creative and to be relentlessly resourceful, right? You want to get an internship offer, um, think of as many ways as possible to get there uh, and just keep working backwards from each individual step um, such that you can get an internship and get what you want. Right, so um, the ideal thing that happens at the end of this process is you get an offer, right? If you have multiple offers, that's good. You have the luxury of choice and you can like do things like negotiate if you want. We're not gonna be talking about this here. There are tons of guides out there. You can talk about this in the project internship if you want, but ultimately remember that the one offer for whatever period you're applying, you're applying to is all you need, right? You don't need like multiple offers. You just need one offer because you're gonna be working one job. Right, so um, we spent a lot of time talking about internships, but now we should talk a bit about some alternatives, right? Like an internship isn't a be all and all for your career or for your life. Um, there are many other things you can do that even if it's purely for the advancement of career of your career, um, there are many other alternatives that are still useful, right? So um, for example, you can work on your own project or own startup, right? If you have an idea that really interests you, you can just work on it, right? And at the end of it, what you'll get is experience working on code and probably like a project you can put on GitHub or on your resume saying you have X amount of users, right? If you have an idea you want to take to market, you can do that as well, right? And you learn a lot of things and gain a lot of useful skills and also gain an entry on your resume uh, if you want, right? Another good alternative is undergraduate research. So um, research is quite unique, right? It lets you work on like a very specific problem at very great depth. And sometimes you know, people are like, oh, um, I would rather do an internship than research. And that, that's probably the case for many of you, right? But remember that um, research gives you something like useful to talk about. I think it displays like a skill to interviewers that, oh, okay, you're able to work on a big problem at length um, and think deeply about this problem and it might be useful for you as well, right? Um, other things you can do are like open source. So just contributing to open source, you can just start by like just typing into the GitHub search bar, like label colon um, good first issue. Right, so many many um, open source maintainers they'll label issues with this good first issue label or like uh, help one third, and you can just work on issues that you like. Right, or alternatively, you can like join these like programs like Google Summer of Code, and like there are a lot of programs like Google Summer Google Summer of Code where you work on open source, but you get like a mentor, and it's like a structured program, and it might be useful for you um to show that you are able to write code in a team. Right, and lastly, of course, 
Um, mental health is important. You can choose to take some time to relax and breathe. Right, this is something that you should manage for yourself, and it's something that will probably um make going into the internship application process in August um it make, might make it easier for you if you're in a better mental state. Right, so just manage this yourself. Um, our parting thoughts. Uh, parting. We have some parting thoughts for this talk. Um, so firstly. Um, remember, again, we've talked about this at length, but remember that this process is extremely emotionally exhausting and tiring, right? This is something that everyone goes through. It's something that um, you should be aware that everyone goes through, so it's not unique to you. And it's something that you should expect and manage as you go in, right? So don't get too overwhelmed by it. As long as you are prepared for it to be tiring, um, hopefully you'll be at a better state to manage that when it does indeed become exhausting and tiring, right? Something else that's useful is that remembering that your friends are going through the process with you, right? So like talk to them, help each other out, find a community um, where you can discuss like internship interviews and like, like your anxieties and so on and so forth. Uh, you can use, for example, the Project Intern Telegram group, right? To find like a support network and like discuss um, interviews and discuss thoughts about applying for internships, right? And also remember that you only need one offer. Right. Again, we've, we've talked about this as, at length as well, but you only need one offer. Um, it's okay if you apply to 100 jobs and you get rejected from 99 because at the end of the day, you still have an internship. Right. Um, the next thing is that there's no such thing as not being prepared enough. Um, so there are a few discussions in the Project Intern Telegram chat on this, but basically this boils down to um, once you see an application, right, once you see an internship posting, you should just apply for it. Right. You shouldn't be like, oh, okay, I need like two more weeks to like prepare uh, before I apply. Right. Um, preparation involves accumulating learnings and even if you fail an interview, it's probably really good preparation for your future interviews. And even if um, you don't want to do an interview yet, right, you're truly not prepared, you're in the middle of like five midterms, um, it's okay to just schedule your interview um, at a later date, right? But it's important to get yourself in the pipeline as early as possible because um, companies have limited resources, right? Um, maybe there are 10,000 people applying for this internship posting, but you only have like um, 50 engineers who are free to like do interviews, right? Then getting yourself as an applicant in the pipeline as early as possible probably gives you a higher chance of getting an interview and um, like a higher chance of being one of the first few to pass the hiring bar and get an offer, right? And lastly, uh, remember that luck plays a huge um, part in this process, but luck also favors those who are prepared, right? So be prepared for this internship application process. Before we, we go into the panel discussion, I just want to introduce the project intern mentorship thing that we're doing. So as usual, every year we run a mentorship session where uh, we'll be sending out a sign-up form soon. And um, basically you can sign up and um, our mentor will come and speak with you over summer for about an hour to answer questions you might have on like how to deal with some aspects of your career or internship prep or where you should apply to and things like that. So we'll be sending that link out, the sign-up link for that out shortly. And if you're interested to, to basically have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone who's a senior, probably in year three, year four or an early graduate, um, this is a good opportunity to basically run your thoughts by someone, right? So um, moving on, we're now going to introduce our panelists. So um, our first panelist is Ahan. Ahan. Oh, hello, everyone. Um, Ahan here. Yeah, I just recently graduated um, from NUS last year, so it's been about a year now. I'm a PhD student at UIUC, and I research very high, high-performance um, machine learning uh, by building better compiler abstractions. And in the past, I've interned at NinjaVan, Google, and Citadel, so like startup, big tech, and finance. So feel free to ask me any questions about research and uh, and or internships and what the differences are between the two. Thank you, Ahan. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Chaitanya. You can just call me Chai. I'm, I graduated last year, and I'm working as a software engineer at Stripe right now. So I previously interned at CVWO, Garena, and Stripe. I also did a Europe and an FYP, like research projects in my last two years. So if you want to know how that contrasts, maybe Han will be the best person, but I can try to help too. Yeah. Thank you, Chai. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Francis, and I currently work at uh, Lalia, uh, an edutech startup at uh, The Hangar. And I used to study uh, computer engineering. Uh, you can see that I also interact in various places doing other stuff. Um, but, and I'm, but now I'm doing um, software engineering and all yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Francis. Hi, everyone. So I'm Noel, and I graduated like earlier this year. 
Um, I'm currently working at Rising Wave Labs as a database kernel engineer. Uh, and I've mainly been working in startups, uh, working in some like niche areas like uh, compilers, uh, systems engineering and stuff like that. So if you're interested in like startups, I guess you can ask me some questions. Yeah. Ooh, thank you, Noel. Hi everyone, I'm Ria and I've previously interned at a startup, uh, then I interned at Twitter and I'll be joining WISE uh, full-time. Uh, so I just just finished my exam, so I'll graduate soon. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions about those, you can ask me. Or Also, I started out in year one in computer science, but eventually I graduated with business analytics and econs, but I'm doing software engineering. So if you're confused, um, yeah, you can just talk to me. Cool. Thank you, Ria. And lastly, we have Suyash. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Suyash. I graduated quite a while ago uh, during COVID. And I interned at a couple of places, twice in the US and a couple of times in Singapore. Yeah, happy to answer any questions. Cool. Thank you very much. So, um, what we're going to do here is, um, for those of you folks who have filled out the RSVP form, we've got a bunch of questions and we've collated them. And we're going to go through those questions first. And then after that, what we're going to do is uh, we'll look through the questions that you guys have submitted live, and then we'll go through those questions. Right? Okay, so the first question we have here is, um, should I diversify my internship experience with different roles or should I specialize in one specific role? So I think Noel and Francis, you guys have a lot of startup experience and you've done a diverse range of things. Um, do you guys want to share your thoughts on this? Yeah, oh, okay. Uh, oh, sorry. You want to go first? Go, I'll go first. Thank you, Noel. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I think that uh, with every internship, you should have some some sort of like intention, right? Be it like um, gaining technical mastery right, over like um, in a field, right? Or maybe exploring. So I, I think for me personally, I was really doing the exploring um kind of internship, which is why I interned at DSO to do cybersecurity, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, and I could use my computer engineering background to do some stuff there. Um, also dabble a bit with um ERBR. Um, also again exploring, and I, and I think that it gives you kind of perspective um on how the things that you learn in school can apply differently in different fields, right? Um, and it can also further inform what kind of warnings you might take in the future. Um, and it will definitely change your roadmap. Uh. Yeah. So I, I think um, it really depends on what you're looking for. If you're still confused, I would encourage you to try as many things as possible. Um, if you are dead set on software engineering, by all means, right? But again, there's many different types of software engineering. Hello? Well, uh, yeah, so actually, I actually, yeah, I was going to say what Francis talked about, actually. Like, uh, I think it's very important to explore and, like, know what's out there. Um, especially, like, earlier on, I think, in your uh, uni life. So maybe, like, year one or year two, like, I would encourage, like, taking, I guess, risk, kind of, like, riskier internships. So it might not be, like, it might not be, like, at, at a big company or something like that, but it could be in an area that you are very, like, interested in. So, like, uh, I would recommend you really try a lot of these kind of, I guess, like, uh, uh, I guess you, you can say like riskier internships earlier on. Uh, and then like, uh, that will kind of give you an idea of like, uh, what your interests are and like, uh, what area you want to move towards. Um, yeah. Right. Thank you. So I guess the consensus seems to be that uh, we should explore to figure out um, what we really want to do and take school as an opportunity to basically have that safe space to explore different things now, right? If I understand the both of you correctly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, next up, we have another question. So what were some of your top considerations when applying for internships and why were they your top considerations? Or maybe we can have Ahan answer this first. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, this is a very tricky question. And I think like uh, people will give a lot of diverse answers um, to this. But for me personally, things like like quality of work and type of work matter a lot and certain companies specialize in something um, that other companies don't do at all for example if you want to work in finance the kind of work that you'll be doing is vastly different to the kind of work that you'll do at a startup 
at startups, you work really fast, you get a lot more responsibility, you may do things outside of even software engineering. And if that's really important for you, um, yeah, I would encourage you to apply to startups. Um, even in finance itself, there's a huge spectrum from like really low latency, high throughput programming to uh, fairly generic software engineering. Um, in big tech, of course, you have the chance to work at like really large um, on really large systems and uh, things at scale, which um, are very different from potentially a startup. Um, yeah, so like these were some of my considerations when I was applying, basically like quality and type of work. Yeah, makes sense. Um, Noel, do you have anything to add? Um, so for me, like, yeah, it's actually going into like uh, uh, niche areas that I was interested in. Because I think that's kind of like, uh, what you call it? Like, uh, people aren't really looking at it too much or so. So it's like, you know, you could have an advantage in that area because you're exploring a niche. Um, and like some of these areas are actually really interesting. So like, I think the common opportunities out there were like were web dev and stuff like that. And I think those opportunities you can kind of always get. Okay, I'm not sure whether that's the case now, but uh, so I tried really hard to find like, things like to work on like compilers uh smart contracts uh, things which are i guess kind of harder to come by yeah awesome thanks and i think chai has something to say yeah hi uh so uh i think ahan and i'll raise great points about what kind of technically inclined considerations you should have but at least when I was looking for internships, I was also trying to optimize for non-technical things. Uh, like I was trying to find places which are known to have like good people. They're known to give you responsibility in a structured way. Sometimes uh, they have, you know, like I've I've heard good things about the manager, or I've heard good things about how the company operates. Uh, you know, you don't have a lot of bureaucracy or the projects you get tend to be more impactful than if you worked at some other place. Uh, so it's not just the kind of work you want to do, but that they, it's not just those factors that need to be considerations. Uh, you can also think about what kind of a place and environment you want to work at. Um, yeah. And you know, what kind of autonomy and responsibility and uh, just, you 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 get to experience different kinds of culture and how different kinds of companies operate in a more intangible way. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Cool. Thank you so much, Chai. So we, we see that there's both a uh, a technical side of like what kind of hard skills you want as well as the kind of culture that that is important to you. Um. Okay. So moving on to a very topical question. Um. Thoughts on the recent job market given the layoffs. Um, so this is a little open-ended. Um, so if you've been working for a bit, do you want to share about this? Uh, uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, it's very unfortunate that this is happening, right? And especially given the number of CS graduates we have these days, and also non-CS graduates who are entering software engineering, with the whole job market being the situation that it is, it is pretty unfortunate. But I guess there will always be ups and downs, and we just have to brace for that and prepare for prepare ourselves uh, for that. When I graduated, I think COVID was in full blow. And then a lot of people, we lost our uh, return offers and stuff, me included, and a bunch of my other friends also didn't get their offers. So it's not a thing that's happening for the first time. This kind of thing comes and goes. And I mean, it's a, it's a downtime now, but then it'll come back up again. And we just have to find a shelter for the time being until it goes back up, I suppose. Cool. Um, thank you, Sesh. And Chai, what do you yeah, think yeah. Uh, now that you've graduated into this and you've been working for just over a year? Yeah, um, I've actually never experienced a layoff. So when I joined two months later, there was a layoff. It was pretty shocking. I, I do think it's it's not the best thing to happen, but uh, I think Sesh has talked about how to, how, how to tie this time. Uh, just more specifically, I, I, I one good thing about this entire big tech breaking down layoffs is pro it probably gives people the opportunity to consider more unconventional options in places to reach out at, uh, you know, companies you would not think about if you were, if, 
if you companies you wouldn't think about and you think about you know facebook google things like that um things that come to my mind and what i tell people are you can if you can always reach out for a summer research and assistant position i think a lot of people discount that possibility and not even consider it but there's a fair bit of technically challenging and interesting work happening with professors you know implementing research based systems um and it it it's not completely different from software engineering you still code stuff you still write systems which you know make they have to do something right so that's one thing um and apart from that you know startups are always there um uh, and just places you would not consider otherwise um are probably you can you can check them out one thing i've noticed is among my friends who who were laid off uh more more often than not they end up finding places that are either they are better places or they end up joining more interesting positions even if it's not a conventionally better place so um it's not all bad i think objectively it is bad but there it's just some considerations when to type, to go through these times yeah suraj's question uh yeah i think you, yeah if you, if you if you know profs in nus you're interested to work under just drop them an email that's how i found both my research project profs um but apart from that yeah just and i've been fairly contained within nus in terms of finding research opportunities but maybe ahan or noel can talk more about it um outside of NUS. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just to add on to that, um you can you can definitely find opportunities outside as well. There are a lot of great research programs like summer EPFL. There's some robotics uh, programs and some summer um research programs that are much more um uh methodical, like kind of like a course, but you'll actually work one-on-one -on -one with a course with with a professor here in the United States. Also, um, it's very discounted, but professors in the United States, they are recruiting, uh, they they typically recruit folks for research internships very, very frequently. And um, I, I was pretty uh, shocked by the fact that there's that much involvement um, with, with, with other folks there. So um, yeah, please do consider that. And usually professors on their website will write when they're recruiting for um uh for uh, such positions so yeah you can keep a look out there yeah yeah but yeah just just i think something came in my mind just on on the way of applying to lesser known places in year one you know why is transfervise which is now why is a better known company now but in year one i applied and i went through all the interview rounds i never ended up getting the internship that's separate but there are companies which are not as well known but they're still really good and they're willing to you know uh, interview your know, ones year twos so maybe just going to linkedin or just other job aggregators and finding places which are not that well known might also be an option given the current freeze in hiring in a bunch of other places yeah cool um so thank you very much guys um so basically we're, we're looking at finding shelter we're looking at finding alternative opportunities and given the internship on the internship side of things we're looking at alternatives like doing research projects as well so that we can survive this sort of uh this downturn and things will definitely get better uh so moving on to the next question yep so um, one question we got is what are some mistakes to not to make in the company i think this means like um what are some things you should you shouldn't be doing when you're at the internship because many of you are starting internships, right? Um, I think Ria, you can answer. Yeah. So I think I have like two points based on personal experience. I think in my first internship, I was really focused on just what my project is, what my team is doing. And um, I understand that that would be the case because the first time you're Act, like you get access to such a large code base it can be overwhelming but I think one mistake was to just stay within the confines of my own team and my own project so I would suggest like if you do have access if you're in a company that's open with their resources try to make use of them and try to get a better understanding of how things work I think it um 
really helps to put what you're doing into perspective and also just gain like more understanding of what's being done. And I think another mistake that I made also in my first internship was it was during COVID. So I think I wasn't, I'm not very good at Slack communication. I prefer like uh, communicating uh, either via call or in person. So I think I've done better in internship where I can meet my mentor or meet my manager in person. So in my first internship, if I had a problem or if I had an issue, I would just sit with it for very long and try to figure it out. But I think as a year or two, um, a lot of the things were just out of my ability and it would have just been easier if I had been better at communicating with my mentor like hey this is a problem I'm facing and if it was fixed then I would have made a lot more progress so two things one is like venture out into what the company is doing what other resources they have and two is um, maybe make like be try to improve your communication skills especially via text because uh, work from home and all of those seem to be the norm coming forward. Got it. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone else have anything you want to add for this? Yeah, I think um, yeah, this is a very tricky question. It's also a very good question. Um, but um, yeah, one thing that people don't really focus about on is is networking as well. Yeah, I think um, we also touched upon this. But like, yeah, try to meet as many people as you can, um, both inside and outside of CS. Um, yeah, people are doing really awesome things. Um, all around in a company. And it's it's really cool to understand, like if you're developing a product, how end-to-end -end that works from, you know, PMs all the way down to um, actual core developers to that product. And it really helps you to, um, you know, know what the impact of your work is. And like, yeah, 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 I guess that's what I wanted to add. Cool, okay. So um, basically uh, communicate effectively, um, try to explore as much of the resources as, as the company offers and try to network with as many people as possible. Okay, so uh, moving on. Uh, the next question is, what is something you wish you would have known earlier in your internship journey? So I think Francis and Noel, you guys are a good uh, fit for this because you guys have done so many different kinds of internships in so many different areas. Do one of you guys want to start? Yeah, I can go first. Um, I... I like to think that my internship journey has been like quite okay, right? not too many um, regrets. But I think one, one thing is that um, I would tell my past self would be um, to try to take roles that do valuable or meaningful work. Um, I think it's one common misconception that as an intern, you can only do so much in, and it's okay for you to make like a small dent or a small impact in the company. I, I think the I, I feel that the interns should desire to make a big impact in the company, right? Uh, and if you aren't given that opportunity, then I think you, you should try to um, seek for some opportunities. Um, yes, well. Okay, yeah. So uh, for me, I think it would be to be not so fixated on what you want to, like on, on one specific area early on. Because for me, actually, I. I felt like I was very fixated on like just working in Haskell like very early on. And that actually closed a lot of doors for me um, uh, uh, as a result. Like I felt like we have tried many, many more things. So I think, yeah, very important is to like explore and just keep an open mind. Uh, the second thing I think is to focus on soft skills development. I think that's not really emphasized enough. Like uh usually you go to an internship and you're thinking oh i'm gonna learn this technical skill but i think the soft skill actually is a lot uh to a certain extent a lot more uh valuable um and like uh, yeah one way you can develop it would be just consistently ask for feedback uh maybe like uh, every two weeks um that kind of thing and like ask your manager specific questions on how you're doing in certain areas for your soft skills yeah I think uh, I just want to add on from, uh, I think when I started out, I was very confused. So one thing that I did was limiting yourself. So I think when I was in my first and second year, I did not consider 
my resume like worthy of even applying to certain companies so don't set the bar for yourself like if the companies really don't want you they'll just reject you like they're not going to hold it against you like how dare this person even apply to our company right because when in my second third year i started finally gaining some confidence and i actually did the oas i felt that even my past self they might not have passed the entire oa or the entire process but would have at least done a lot more like gotten pretty far in the process if i had actually tried uh and i think because every year you build on your previous experience if i had um not limited myself earlier maybe it would have like gone higher yeah Oh, uh, cool. Okay. So um, I think Ria, can we just keep you on for the next question, which I think is quite relevant, Um, which is what can someone do to stand out as a non-CS major breaking into tech? Right. So I'm, I was from business analytics. So business analytics, luckily, is still part of school of computing. So I did gain um basic technical skills and had certain projects to have on my resume but if you're from something that's completely off obviously the first suggestion would be to build some projects or get your hands dirty and um actually have something on a resume because i think it becomes very hard for a resume to pass a resume screen if you don't have a lot of technical stuff on it um and then um I'm not sure if it's a great idea, but at least for business analytics or information systems, um, I think uh, at least on my resume, I just put business analytics very small and I made it school of computing um, because um, when people hear the word business analytics, they assume that it's business. And then I have to answer like a lot of questions about uh, whether I have the technical skills or not. So I would try to like minimize that point part of your um um, yeah, like that part of your educational journey and focus more on the skills that are relevant to the jobs that you're applying to because again a resume doesn't have to like have everything that you've done it has to have the relevant sections um, of experiences that you own yeah related to the job cool so i um, trying to play up your tech background a little bit more and doing things like personal projects that can help you um, <laughs> talk about this uh, Noel you had some thoughts on this as well yeah, so actually, I think the first internship is always the hardest to get, like, regardless whether you're a CS graduate or non-CS major. I uh, actually have friends who recently uh, got into software engineering, and I think they are doing pretty well. Like, uh, just in, I think, year, late year three, maybe, they start, started getting into it. So it's always possible. And so the, the thing you want to focus on is really, like, uh, optimizing your resume for experience. You want to have projects which highlight the tech stack of the company that you are interested in. And you should uh and one way you can try to get this first internship is also to look into uh, I guess niches which may not be so technically like uh difficult. For example, like uh, iOS or Android app development, it might be very product focused, right? And actually, like it's kind of underrated. Uh, so like, like less people might apply for it, but then it, it might be easier for you to land these roles because you have portfolio projects that you can build on the site. Uh, yeah, so like other things is like hackathons can lend you internship positions. Like at some banks, uh, they bulk hire through hackathons. I'm not sure whether that is still the case now. Um, there's some, also some uh, programs out there that actually hire uh, people from non-CS backgrounds. Like I think like summation program from SG Innovate. So you can also look for these like specific kind of programs which are tailored for like non-CS graduates looking to transition. Yeah, so Singapore, I think, has quite a few of those like uh, programs. Right, so it seems that um, these places are quite forgiving in the sense that um, as long as you have technical experience, the exact degree or whatever you come from is not super important as long as you can show that you have that background. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I actually have an interesting example to share. One of my seniors, he graduated, I think, in Suyesh's batch, maybe. Um, he was from a industrial design uh, background, but then he also broke into tech and, and he learned to code and then he was able to get um, positions in NUS as an RA doing some tech work. So it definitely is possible um, and it is entirely within reach. Um, it's a slightly harder path, but it's, it's not, um, not impossible. So um, moving on. Yeah, so... Um... 
one question is how important is having personal projects or like contributing to open source? Um, Chai, do you have anything to say? Hi, sorry, just got a call. Uh, yeah, uh, I I do think like like Noel mentioned in the previous previous qu previous question, it's it is important for your resume to show that you can do technical things to some degree. Um, if you don't have prior inter internship experience or if you don't have any work experience, having personal projects or contributing to open source is the way to show that you can work on decently large projects. Uh, with the and have that technical knack right um uh, i do wanna so it's not like i i my general recommendation tends to be i'm, I'm not sure if people will disagree is if you don't have any prior internship experience try to add do some personal projects and add those to your resume instead to show that you can you have technical experience but i do want to caveat that, that by saying that a lot of a lot of people applying to their first or second internships feel that Oh no, you know, I made this one project, which is super simple. I don't know if I even want to mention it in my resume. Um, and my response to that is usually just, just mention it because even projects which you think are simple still show technical, technical capabilities. More often than not, maybe you, in software engineering firms, you're not really doing like state of the art stuff all the time. You're, you're, you're doing stuff which is very similar to what you'll be doing when you do personal projects sometimes, right? So uh, just it, it, it's, it doesn't need to be just a print statement, right? But if it's a working app, something which creates any sort of value or even helps you learn a new tech stack, I think it's totally fair game to mention it in your resume. As long as you can talk about it um, and tell your interviewers what you learned by taking on that project, I think it's totally okay, yeah. Yeah, that's 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 what I think about just pro personal projects and open source. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Francis, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I I, I actually um looked through quite a bit of uh, resumes for people who apply into my company. So I, I think one of the things that I I often see right is like the two one o three projects and like maybe the the into the AI projects and it's a tic tac toe one. So I I always see the Duke project. I always see the IP, the individual project and the team project. So I think that these personal projects and open source projects will definitely help you to differentiate yourself from the crowd. Because everyone is doing Toronto O3, I tell you. Yeah, so even having this simple game, right, is like going to level up your um, resume game by like that much, you know. You're going to be like the, the regular folks. Lah. Um, and I think that it also sends like a message of like what kind of um, developer of you are right, whether or not you have the something and the drive, right? Learn more on your own, right? It shows that you have the, the, the fire in your belly, right? To like be self driven enough to like you know work on some things on your own. Um, and I think that employees would really look out for that, lah, having this um passion, right? Because they're not really as, as much as they want to nurture you, right? Into like the developer that you the, the best developer that you can be, but honestly, a lot of um. Um, mentors don't have the time to like handhold you all the way, right? So it'd be really great that you can show that you are an independent learner, you're here to like hustle hard, right? And like bring it out of the team. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. So I guess these personal projects and open source contributions help you like stand out, especially when you're applying for your first few internships and also like demonstrate your interest in the tech. Let's see. Cool. Um, so the last question from the list of like uh, pre-submitted questions we have is uh, what's the best way to land an interview for US internships? Um, so I think Suresh and Ahan, you guys both have experience with that. Um, maybe one of you can start us off. Yeah, I can go first. Um, I think uh, as you all mentioned early on during your presentation, it's really like a numbers game. Um, you just really have to apply. There's no guarantee that you would get it. Um, but if you're apply to 100 places, you might get an interview for like four of them, right? And you might be able to pass one of them and then you get one where it's a lot harder because of that. They have visa restrictions. They don't have a um, US companies don't know if they can give you a return off. If they give you a return off, would you be able to make it back? So a lot of things that people do are try to kind of reassure these companies that they can actually work in the States. So for a lot of Singaporeans, they will put eligible for H1B1 on top of their resume to show that uh, they have this special visa category that they can work with in the States. That's the thing that people do very commonly. Um, 
otherwise you really just do have to apply. Uh, if you go to Reddit, I think uh, see, I think it's CS majors or CS career questions. There's the the, the some subreddits which do this compilation of all every single US company that's offering internships in the particular at a particular time, both for summers and winters. Right. And although it's a bit exhausting, what I've done in the past is literally just go down the list and apply to all of them. If not all, like as many as possible. Right. And just hope that some of them reply. I've gotten replies from some very weird places in the past. Um, the other things that I've done, um, there was this once where uh, I saw a tweet from this um, uh, engineer in Apple on the Swift compiler team saying that they were hiring for full-timers. And I just kind of replied back to the guy to be like, hey, are you hiring interns? And, and then um, I got an interview that way. And it's unconventional again. I'm just trying to maximize my chances in the numbers game again, right? Trying to find avenues to kind of get through somehow. Um, it's not easy, but yeah, that's the best you can do, I think. Cool. So um, essentially being relentlessly resourceful, um, like like we talked about earlier, but in general, it's it's the same process. Um, and and when it comes to full time jobs, I guess indicating your H one B one eligibility as a Singaporean probably helps as well. Um, Ahan, given you're in the US now, do you have any thoughts on this as well? Yeah. Um. Yeah. I guess. Uh. Yeah. I guess. Um. What CR said is really on point. Um. Yeah. The only thing that I can also add. Yeah. I, I guess as as you said, Azim is being rel relentlessly resourceful. And um, also one one other avenue is potentially cold calling, uh, cold emailing recruiters as well. Um, I think that's uh, super underplayed. People think that it doesn't make a difference, but sometimes it can. And honestly speaking, you only need one cold email to work out um, for it to potentially impact you. Um, yeah, so things like this that people won't typically think about like these unconventional avenues, because um, there are a lot of ways to apply to a company above and beyond just clicking the button on their website. Um, so yeah, in addition to what CR said, that's the only thing I wanted to add. All right, cool. So um, trying out different ways as well to, to get in touch with basically someone who can push your application through. Okay, so um, we are a little short on time. So we're going to do two of the questions that came in from, from the, the live Q&A link. Um, the first one uh, we have here is, uh, should I take an unpaid internship? Um, I think that's something that goes closer to the startup world. So I guess back to Francis and Noel, what do you guys think? No. I think if like, the startup like, values your work and your time, they definitely, they definitely should pay you. Yeah, no matter how poor the startup is, and I can speak from my experience, no matter how poor the startup is, they can pay you. If they can't pay you, they're not doing startups like, seriously enough. <laughs> Okay, so getting paid is, is important. Don't do free work. Uh, Noel, do you uh, the same I, sentiment? I think there's an age case, like research labs. You can do research internships. Sometimes it's unpaid. But Noble is very interesting and meaningful. But I guess they just don't have enough funding to pay you. Yeah. Uh, apart from that, yeah, I think generally there's always some sort of internship that would... Like generally, they should be able to pay you a small stipend. Like, um, yeah. Okay, so um, we, yeah, I understand that a lot of these research places they are reliant on like funding grants, and so if that doesn't work out, sometimes they they may not be able to pay you, but then that might be useful for your resume or or in terms of the kind of work they're interested in doing. But generally, yeah, I think free work um is something that we should try to avoid. Um, another question that I think a lot of people might be wondering about is that um, how important are grades when applying to jobs? Um. Chai, do you want to, to start us off on what do you think about grades? Sure. I've never been asked for my GPA or my transcript or my grades in any interview or any application I've ever applied to. Yeah. So I, I don't think it matters that much at all, uh, especially for software engineering firms or just software engineering jobs. Uh, maybe when you go to more academic places, this, it, grades start mattering a little more. I think Ahan can talk more about it, but at least... In my experience, never been asked for GPA or my grades anywhere. I should be able to talk about what what kind of classes I've done and what I found interesting, but that's about it. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Noel? Yeah, so I can share like, okay, so my GPA is not that good. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you like the places you'll probably get screened out of. So like 
Fang, some of them will actually screen GPA. Uh, uh, some HFT companies, not all of them will, but some some will screen your GPA. Uh, yeah, so you will lose like a few of these opportunities, right? But I think there's a trade-off that you can make. So for me, actually, I uh, work like uh, part-time throughout like my whole school life. And so that is kind of the trade-off. Like I trade off my grades for a lot of this like working experience. So for me, the reason I did that is um, I guess just having that income is nice. <laughs> so it might be important to some of you. Um, but I think the other thing was also like uh, I am someone who learns a lot more like by doing hands-on work. So that was kind of the conscious trade-off that I made. Like, okay, sure, I'm going to do a poorly here, but I'm also going to try and learn like all of these things like outside of it. Yeah. So it may not be the right thing to do. I mean, everybody has their own personal like take on this, but yeah, this is my own uh yeah, rationale for it. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Noel. Um, Ahan, do you have any thoughts on grades as well? Since Shai mentioned that maybe sure, sure. Yeah. Activity. Um, yeah, I, I actually it's it's very ironic because academic jobs care even less about grades than um than undergrad uh, software engineering roles, actually. Um when 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 you want to enter an academic job, it's all about uh the number of publications that you have. Um but um, yeah, I think for an undergrad uh, software engineering role, grades aren't the be all and end all. Some companies may have certain bars, like you need to get above an X GPA, but they're usually not unreasonable, unreasonably high. Um, I also think it's very, very rare for a company to do that. I actually only know one company that does that. Um, and they told me their bar and it wasn't um, unreasonable to attain, that's for sure. Um, yeah, so I think if you're optimizing to get straight A's at the expense of personal projects and getting your hands dirty in like things that you're actually like building stuff, then I think you may be going about it a, a little incorrectly if your goal is uh, software engineering. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. So I, I guess we, we see that um, grades are not the be all end all. And in fact, uh, it might be more important to prioritize experience for yourself over uh, grades in more circumstances. Okay, so unfortunately, um, I know there are a lot of really good questions, but we can't take all of them because of the fact that we're limited by time. Um, but what we are doing now is that we have the breakout rooms. So we're going to open that up uh, now. And we'll have three rooms, so Francis and Noel in the first room, Ria and Suresh in the second, and Ahan and Chai in the third. Uh, and you guys are free to join those rooms and go and ask these guys all the questions that you have. 